Hi everybody, welcome to Light on the Rock. You know how we try to define words. Someone, a child or somebody says, what does this word mean? There are certain words that you travel around the world that have different meanings, have broader meanings than just what we might expect. For example, the word, um, the word aloha. In, uh, in Hawaii, uh, we, we think of it meaning hello, but it can also mean a whole bunch of other things besides that. And it's, it's somewhat similar in some ways to the Hebrew word shalom, where we think it means peace, but it can be a greeting, it can be a goodbye, it can be all kinds of things. There's another word I want to talk about today, a very, very important word, and that word is grace, God's grace. And we think of grace as uh, favor or pardon, uh, unmerited, unearned, but it's so broad, so much broader than I think we're giving it credence. So that's what I want to talk about today. Hello, I'm Philip Shields. Welcome to Light on the Rock, all of you. And I hope that uh, you'll enjoy coming here more often than just this sermon. Be sure you hear part two. Part two will cover a lot of things I know I won't have time to cover today. And also, if you wouldn't mind, if you would register for Light on the Rock, register on there. Once in a while, give us a thumbs up or or a like, something like that, comment, because that really generates a lot more volume to us when you do. Uh, YouTube and others will uh, send more people to us. And so please, if you would do that, send, uh, leave comments, I would really appreciate it. Um, let's talk about grace. I was raised in a church that pretty much limited the meaning of grace to unmerited pardon. Unmerited pardon. I, I was told that as a child growing up, as a teenager, as a young man, as, a, as I got older, it was unmerited pardon. And yet as I studied the Bible and uh, looked at it very carefully, there were so many verses where if you said it, the word there means unmerited pardon, it made no sense. We're to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, in the unmerited pardon of Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3.18, I think it is. Uh, how about the descriptions about Yeshua? When I say, I say Yeshua, the Hebrew name for Jesus, just so you know in the notes and on video, Yeshua is Jesus, okay? Uh, the name the angel told his mother to call him. Uh, we read it in our English Bibles and think the angel was talking in English and said his name shall be Jesus. No, he was talking in Hebrew to a Hebrew woman and he said uh, his name shall be Yeshua. <clears throat> Luke 2.39 and the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And the favor of God was upon a child growing up who had no sin? That makes no sense. The unmerited pardon, you see? Luke 2.52, a few verses later, Jesus increased in wisdom and nature, stature, I mean, in favor, same word used for grace, in grace with God and man. See, it, it, Grace, meaning pardon, would not make sense there. So when I say favor, a lot of times when you read favor in the New Testament English, uh, you're probably reading the very same Greek word most of the time, if not all the time, uh, where they get that word, the haris, or haris. Um, it looks like charis, C-H-A-R-I-S, but it's pronounced without the, the hard C. It's, it's haris. And most people say charis or charis. It's haris. And all the research I can do on it. So anyway, in John 1.14, the last part says, speaking of Yeshua as being full of unmerited pardon, full of grace. No, full of favor and truth. So a good, short, stronger definition right off the bat. All of you who have this teaching in your head like I did, that it means primarily, solely, unmerited pardon, be thinking of it stronger as the unmerited favor, the joy, the kindness and blessings of God for you, for salvation in Christ. From start to finish. Haris, grace, haris, it will transform us. It's what we need to make us a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17, for you are now a new creation in Christ. What a wonderful word. This is, it, 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 you, you won't be a new creation. You won't feel like a new creation until you understand the meaning, complete meaning of Harris or grace as meaning unmerited joy, favor, blessings, God's pleasure with you, 
God liking you, God being wanting to pour his blessings on you, God wanting to transform you and loving you. That's the meaning of it, really is. Kind of like trying to define aloha or shalom. It's, it's not just a word or two. So I believe this has got to be in the top two or three topics that I've ever covered on my website. And um, so it's important we get, get it right. I've spent a lot of time on it. And I hope that you will really enjoy it a lot as well. So I think you're going to hear some things today, especially if you come from uh, other groups that, that have taught grace, meaning unmerited pardon. So again, uh, Strong's number 5485, Charis, or Harris. Uh, it's spelled like Charis, C-H-A-R-I-S in the Greek. The favor that causes joy, pleasure, acceptance, gratitude, and thanksgiving. In the Hebrew, 2580, the word is like the chicken hen. Hen, uh, favor, grace, acceptance. 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 Let these words sink in. Joy. Pleasure. Way beyond pardon. Acceptance. Gratitude for you. Thanks for you. It's far more than just pardon, okay? Otherwise, a lot of these verses just don't make sense. John 17, the last part of it, grace and truth came by Yeshua, came by Jesus Christ. So again, it, it comes from that Greek word, heres. Uh, grace and favor is so important, so important, that Paul said that when he was speaking of different ways of describing what he was preaching, at times he called it the gospel of Christ, the gospel of God, the gospel of peace, the gospel of salvation. Are you aware that all of these gospels are mentioned in the New Testament and more? And the gospel of the grace of God. Is your fellowship, is your church ever talking about and using the phrase, today we're going to talk about the gospel of grace the gospel of the grace of God. I actually had a minister call me up and tell me, Philip, there's no such gospel in the Bible. I looked it up in my concordance. No such Bible. He was looking up uh, gospel uh, of grace, but the actual phrase was gospel of the grace, so it didn't show up in his search. And then I showed him the verse in Acts 20, and he, he was flabbergasted. Acts 20, verse 24 and none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to me, to myself, that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which received I received from the Lord Jesus. My tie is not straight. It's going to bug me. <laughs> okay. And the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. There it is. I want to testify. I want to preach the gospel of the grace of God. That's how important it is. The very next verse goes on to explain what else he talks about. Indeed, now I know you all, Acts 20, 25, among whom I've gone preaching the kingdom of God. Absolutely, it's the kingdom of God. You can't have the kingdom of God without Yeshua. You can't have the kingdom of God without God's favor, his grace. Okay, the kingdom of God. So what else did Paul preach? And we find here that uh, Acts 28, verses 30 to 31, then Paul dwelt two years in his own rented house, I believe this is in Rome now it's talking about, and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. So the gospel is the gospel of grace, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of Jesus Christ about him and what he preached, both of them. Because when you say the gospel of the kingdom, it's not what the kingdom preached. It's about the kingdom. So of means about as well. The whole book of John is about Jesus Christ. The others are too, but especially John. And people say Yeshua never came preaching himself. Go back and read the book of John. I am the door. I am the, I am the, the bread from heaven. I am the good shepherd. I am, you know, all of these things. I'm the vine, on and on and on. He spoke about his mission, about the grace that he was bringing. I mean, they're all meshed together is what I'm saying. The kingdom of God, the gospel of grace, the, the message of Jesus Christ about him and, and of him. There's no kingdom with all, without all that. So today's message is 
is the first part. The second part will be living by grace. This one is about God's grace for salvation. Okay, starting with salvation. That's the focus today. Next time will be living, God's grace for daily living life. I hope you'll definitely hear part two. If we misunderstand grace, we're going to go into one of two main directions. You can go probably a thousand directions. But one or two main ones, Jude says in verse four, I wanted to talk to you about our common salvation, but I have to warn you about this illegitimate message of grace that some out there are polluting. And he says, ungodly men, John, Jude 4, who turned the grace, the favor of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the NIV says license for immorality. And the NASB, national, not national, but the New American Standard, licentiousness. They turn grace into license to sin as much as you want because it doesn't matter. There's enough grace to cover you. And I'll be talking about that same thing, that there's enough grace to cover any sin. But at, when Paul talks about that in Romans 5, the very next verse in Romans 6, shall I say that we should sin then so that grace may abound? God forbid. So we have to get the right balance on that. So anyway, I've spoken a lot about also being perfect. And by the way, but if you heard my sermons, you'll understand, because I'm going to talk about people who, who talk about their own perfection or their own righteousness will get this grace thing entirely wrong. But what I preached is God's perfection for us. I titled it that way on purpose. I initially had it as become you therefore perfect, this, as Yeshua said in Matthew 5, 48. But I titled it God's perfection for us, because that's the only way that you or I are ever going to be perfect in God's eyes without a blot or blemish on us. And I hope you'll go hear that sermon as well. It works very nicely in with this sermon. And in that sermon, I, I used over and over again, Hebrews 10, 14, that by one offering, he, Christ, perfected, has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Hebrews 10, 14. Christ did it. He's the one perfecting us. So I teach, as Paul, Peter, John, all of them teach, that um, as, we're, as we come to salvation and grace, we want to please our Father in heaven. We want to please God. We want to please Yeshua, our Master. We obey not because we are forced to, but because we love to. We love to do what they want us to do. We love to do the right thing. So anyway, um, uh, we're, we're called to, to do good works, uh, not for salvation, but as proof of having been saved. If you go back and look at Ephesians 2, we'll read it shortly. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, For you've been saved by grace, not of yourself, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay, And then in verse 10, it says, To do good works. Okay, so in other words, the result of our salvation is doing good works. We will want to please God. So I don't teach that we can do as we please because of grace. I don't teach Jude 4 kind of grace at all. And in fact, if we continue to seek to do the things of the flesh, we all still stumble. stumble. I do. I, I still do. But if we make our focus things of the flesh, getting rich, uh, doing things, going places, watching things, being at places um, that are carnal. Romans 8, verse 5 and 6 and verse 13 say that you're going to die. You're going to die because when we come to God's grace, it changes us. It transforms us. If we're not being transformed I wonder if when you gave your heart to the Lord and said you believe in him, if it went much further than just your words, it has to go further than that. Excuse me. Many will say to Yeshua, Matthew 7, verses 20 and 21, Wait a minute, Lord. Did we not do mighty works, miracles, wonders in your name? In your name. And he will say to them, Matthew 7, 20, 21, I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. I never knew you. So as you look at various ministers, 
Some may be on TV, some may be very well known. And you like listening to them because they have a lot of miracles going on. That's fine. These signs shall surely follow is, is, is true. But at the same time, the great false prophet at the end time, who is working with the great beast system, the political, economic, military power of the very end time, we're told that Satan himself gives them the power to do wonder, not wonderful, amazing miracles, including calling fire from heaven, works of Satan, but miracles that are so amazing. You'll see people probably being healed, being brought up from the dead. I don't know what will happen, but God allows Satan to do some miracles, apparently, that will deceive the whole world. Be careful that you're not following miracles, especially if that teacher ever talks about not having to worry about Scripture, just the signs themselves are enough. Be, be careful. So anyway, the first extreme is minimizing obedience to God's law because of the way they teach grace. The second extreme, <clears throat> common in some Hebrew roots groups and the Church of God groups that came out of the association with Herbert Armstrong from years ago, is the definition I mentioned at the beginning where we're focusing on unmerited pardon. And that's the extent of it. Pardon. The result is we're not experiencing the joy of salvation. I know many, many people I talk to, if I just ask them point blank, do you ever think if God were watching you and you'd hear a voice from heaven, do you ever think God would say about you, this is my beloved daughter, your name, in whom I'm well pleased. I remember talking to one of the members of my family about that, and they all put their head down, eyes down. No, I don't think so. I don't think God's pleased with me, people say. It's because of the definition of grace being locked into just unmerited pardon. Always feeling like we'll never make it into God's kingdom. You're not the one who makes it to God's kingdom. Jesus does. In you, for you, and you with him. So many people are feeling depressed and joyless as they know that they still stumble in sin all too often. They know that. And among many Sabbath-keeping groups, the understanding of God's grace, therefore, is often based, it's often performance-based. Think what I'm saying here. Your performance-based. It's often based on perfection, your perfection. I mean our, perfor our performance, our perfection. And you'll see that that is so off-base, that's so unscriptural as far as defining grace. Grace does include pardoning us. Don't misunderstand. But it's so much bigger. God's delight with us, God's favor, God's acceptance of us, God wanting to bless us, transform us, change us. That's the real meaning of grace, favor. Haris in, Haris in the Greek. And I think the Church of God folks and some Hebrew roots folks understand the head knowledge of grace. They might be saying, yeah, Philip, I understand that. But they know it here in their head, but not in their heart. So I think when you look at it that way, it explains why we're lacking the joy that we should have. Trying to find peace and joy in a life that's constantly asking for forgiveness because we stumble so much and it's all based on a grace understanding of pardon. Always asking for pardon. Always asking for pardon. You're never going to have the joy of salvation. And they know better, but they keep looking to their performance and they get disappointed with their performance because they don't understand God's righteousness imputed, credited to us that I preached about also and the sermon I gave on God's perfection. I heard one person, one preacher, even say from the pulpit at a Feast of Tabernacles. He said, we do the best we can and God will make up the difference. And I looked around and people dutifully writing that down in their notes. You do, we do the best we can God will make up the difference. Have you heard that? I know when I was sitting there in the congregation hearing that, I'm thinking, no, 
No, that's not it. That's not it. God doesn't make up the difference for salvation, which was the topic. God does it from even before we repent. God's goodness drives you to repentance. God said to Paul, Paul, I've been goading you. In Acts 9, you know, on the road to Damascus, the great light and everything. Paul, why are you kicking against the pricks, the goads? I've been goading you and you just won't pay attention. Why are you persecuting me? God, God was goading you and then his goodness led you to repentance and his goodness forgave you. His goodness gave you his Holy Spirit. His goodness empowers you, changes you, loves you, likes you, is pleased with you. Yeshua even said at one point, Father, let them know that you love them as much as you love me. You love them as you love me. John 17, verse 23. I mean, think about it. If he would make Yeshua die for you and me so that you and I can have salvation, how much love is that showing you about for you? So anyway, we don't know. It's not do the best you can. That's not grace by faith. That's grace by performance, our performance. It's wrong. That's a teaching on grace that, that, that uh, it's just wrong, Okay. Now notice the emphasis on God's love and kindness in the next one we'll read in Ephesians 2 in a minute. All part of grace, divine favor, true grace is all about God granting us salvation, entirely his doing, and we humbly receiving it because the Bible says that, uh, I think it's 1 Peter, I'm trying to remember where it was now, but uh, 1 Peter 5.10, I think that God gives grace to the humble. God gives grace to the humble. So we, when you really acknowledge before him that I am a sinner, I am not what I should be in your eyes. I come before you with all my sins, with all that I am. I give it all to you. That takes humility. Now you can receive God's grace. Even the most wicked king, Ahab. Bible says up until his time, he was the most wicked ever. He was later surpassed by King Manasseh in being the most wicked. But both of those kings, when they humbled themselves, they didn't necessarily totally change their direction of life. But it says about Ahab that he went about... When, when Elijah told him, you're going to die, dogs are going to eat you, birds are going to eat your children, all of this, because of your wickedness and stealing that land from Achan. It says Ahab took off his rich robes and put on sackcloth, and he mourned, and he fasted, and he was humbled. And so God told Elijah, go back and tell Ahab, I've changed my mind. It's going to be a little different from all that. So God loves the humility when we admit this was stupid, what I did wrong, what I did. So Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 10, in, it starts in verse 4. I hope you'll read it yourselves. Let's put it up there now anyways. I'm talking here. For God who is rich in mercy. This is the context of grace. Mercy. Because of his great love with which he loved us. That means you. Even when we were dead, in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, past tense, and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He's saying now that you're in Christ, everything about Christ you're being a part of. Yeshua is sitting on the right hand of the throne of glory, and so are you because you are in Christ. That's what he's saying right there in verse 6. Verse 7, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches Riches of his grace in his kindness, see, kindness, love, mercies, all of these things being equated with grace. Verse 8, for by grace you have been saved. I know there's lots of verses that talk about shall be saved, being saved, put them all together. Once God begins to work with us, he sees the end from the beginning. He sees the end from the beginning. He knows we're going to be there. He knows he's going to finish what he started. So he says here, you have been saved through faith, by grace. By grace, you've been saved through faith. Not, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's not based on our performance. It's not we do the best we can and God makes up the difference. It's not that. And a gift is not something you can buy. A gift is not something you can earn or else it's no longer a gift. 
for we are his workmanship. That's what I was saying earlier, verse 10. Okay, we're saved by grace. The proof of that salvation is that we are a changed person, changing person, created by God for, in Jesus Christ, for good works, which God prepared beforehand we should walk in them. The good works don't save me, but it's evidence of grace working in me. So God's grace is entirely God's doing. Now that's why such a disconnect though. Why, why, why do we have such a disconnect? What we, wait a minute, Philip, people, some of you are already thinking, you're already thinking, but there's so many verses that say we're rewarded by our works, by what we do. Again, salvation is not a reward. Salvation for what you've done. Salvation is a gift which you can't earn, you can't pay for. So the big disconnect is because we keep mixing up salvation with reward. We mix the two together. Salvation is being saved from the second death. The death penalty for our sins is entirely, that salvation is entirely God's gift. It's not based on what we have done. It's not based on uh, what we do except to accept the call to repentance, humbly uh, come before him and accept his loving mercy. You can't pay for all that. You can't pay for salvation. Paul made it very clear. It's either grace or it's works. In Romans 11, verses 5 and 6. Romans 11, verses 5 and 6. And so, too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. For if it's by grace, it's no longer on the basis of works. It's no longer on performance. It's no longer on the best you can do. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. So don't mix up the two. So salvation is God's gift. Salvation is eternal life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. You can't get a better shot at salvation by what you do. It's a gift, okay? Rewards, on the other hand, now that's not salvation. Rewards are based on your works, what you do, what you perform. Numerous scriptures saying we're rewarded by our works. One of the last verses in Revelation 22, at least in the New King James and King James, uh, 22 verse 12, Behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. And there's so many verses about when you pray, pray in private, and when you give alms and give charities, do it privately, don't talk about it, and God will reward you openly. Okay, that's because of a work you did. God will also do a work for in you and bless you. Remember the parable of the talents? A talent was not a talent like we think of talent, where I have a talent for music or a talent to get myself in trouble or whatever it is. A talent was money, okay? Some were given um, two talents, some were given five, some, some were given so on. Um, or or, or there, some were given, anyway, but what happened is, I'm getting that mixed up with another another parable, one turned a talent into, into two, one turned into five, one turned into ten. And so God in turn comes back to them and says, well, I'm going to give you ten cities because of that. Five cities, two cities, and so on. So rewards are based on what we do. What I mean by rewards is what you will be and what you'll be doing for all eternity. Paul says we're building in our works out of either precious stones, gold and silver, which can't be burned up in the fiery trials that are coming in our lives, in our lives and ahead of us? Or are we building on this foundation that Paul laid and others? Are we building with it with straw and wood and hay, stubble and so on? That's going to get burned up. So when the fire comes to test your work, let's pick up your 1 Corinthians 3, verses 14 and 15. If anyone's work which he has built endures, and they will endure if it's gold, silver, and precious stones. Those, those don't burn up. He will receive a reward. Reward. Okay? Because that's your work or what you're building on top of the salvation God's given you. You'll receive a reward. But if anyone's work is burned up, because he's made it out of wood and straw and stubble and so on, hey, he will suffer loss. He will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved but as through fire. He doesn't lose his salvation for being careless with how he built, but he won't have as high a reward. Reward is what you are going to be and what you'll be doing for all eternity. Salvation is eternal life. 
being forgiven of all your sins. So good works will get you a great reward, but it won't get you into the kingdom. Okay? That's salvation. That's God's work. Now, get that out of the way. So, but I think that's why we get confused. I got to work because all these verses talk about rewarded by your works. And you're mixing reward and salvation. We got to stop that. Now let's talk about can God's grace cover all my sins? And some people I know are really bad. Is God really going to have them in the kingdom if they repent and accept him? Can it cover anything? Okay, what is grace? Grace is undeserved goodness from God. Undeserved. God's favor for all of us. God's forgiveness. God's blessings. God's power. God's help to get us through life. That transforms us and gets us ready for eternity. That's grace. Look at John 1, verse 16 and 17. Let's look at what it says about our Savior. He, has, he came with so much grace, like grace upon grace, wave upon wave of grace. I know his grace will cover any, any sin except absolutely refusing him and refusing the working of the Holy Spirit. That's what they call the unpardonable sin. But if you're at all concerned about the unpardonable sin, you haven't committed it. Now, John 1, verses 16 and 17 in the NIV from the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. John 1, 16 and 17. From the fullness of his grace, we've received one blessing. Blessing. Not pardon. Not just pardon. It includes that. One blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. When you come to believe in, in, in the Christ, it won't matter what you've been it won't matter what you've done. God's grace is sufficient to cover you. And if you really understand grace, you'll also extend that grace to other people. There's no sin a person can commit that's bigger than God's grace, okay? Except the, when you totally spit in his face and walk the other way knowingly and rejecting the Holy Spirit. Romans 5, verse 20, 21. One translation has this, that grace superabounded. Romans 5.20, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. Okay, when, when we have God's, when there's a law there, you all of a sudden having, you're having a lot more people driving too fast, uh, more so than before the, that sign went up that the speed limit was 55 or 60 or whatever. People are driving really fast. Now that we have it at 55, all kinds of people are driving over 55. They probably were before too, but now they're being cited. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. One translation says grace superabounded, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. If someone comes to Christ and God in heaven, but was a prostitute for many years, or a thief, or a drug dealer, caused many deaths, or vicious terrorists blowing up shopping malls. Men, women, and children being blown up. Or selling people into slavery. Is there enough grace for those? Would you forgive someone like that? God says he will. Grace superabounded. How about someone who kills someone else? The murderer. Or a rapist. How about a child molester? You bet there's grace that superabounds for any of those and anything else you can come up with. If they confess their sin before God and ask for his mercy. Would you sit in church, though, beside someone you know? Last week, last month, five years ago, was a prostitute or a rapist or whatever. Would you invite them to your home? We'll talk about Second Corinthians, I mean, 1 Corinthians 5. And the misunderstanding about not even eating with such a person who calls themselves a brother who does these things. But if the person's repented, it's all washed away. Would you sit beside David? He killed someone's husband so that he could try to keep her as his wife. Killed somebody. Lots of other people were killed with him. Would you sit beside Paul? He killed people. He says so. He voted for their death. Beat men, men and women and put them in jail. 
He said so. Would you visit in the home of people like this? Or would you say, no, I want nothing to do with that person for something he did 20, 30, 40 years ago? Then you don't understand the grace of God. Because God's grace superabounds, covers every single sin. And also when we, as children of God, still some, st sometimes stumble in sin, grace continues to superabound for us, continues to. We have to fight sin with everything we've got with God's Holy Spirit helping us. We have to resist sin. We have to overcome by God's grace. We are what we are, as Paul said. We must use God's Spirit to obey. But when we stumble in sin, yes, there's grace to cover us. So why do we still need grace after God's Spirit comes? God's Holy Spirit is given usually, though not in every single case, upon the laying on of hands first. Baptism, repentance, baptism, laying on of hands is the usual sequence. Cornelius and his family was an exception. God gave them the Holy Spirit before they were baptized. I think that's Acts 10. Anyway, after we receive God's Spirit, why do you still need grace? Because we all still sin and we all still stumble, like Paul admits in Romans 7. We've talked about that many times. But again, the key point, grace is not just about forgiveness. It's about giving you the power to keep going as well. It's his power to transform you. So you need grace for that, God's favor. We need God's favor to make us a new creation. So the Holy Spirit inside of us is God's very presence. It's him coming into us. It begets us as his very own children. Uh, John 17, 23. And because we're his children, he loves us dearly. And John 17, 23, Yeshua said in a prayer to, to God the Father, he said, Abba, please, please, let, the, let these people in front of me, these 11 that are left now in front of me, know that you love them as you have loved me. Includes Peter who denied Christ. It includes all the others who ran away. They weren't there at the cross, except John. Holy Spirit's given, also gives us God's power. Acts 1 verse 8, Terry, stay here in Jerusalem. God's power will come upon you by the Holy Spirit. And it's to walk and live by that, even though we still sometimes sin. And also now, it gives us God's nature. It, when we get God's seed, we're told that God's nature comes to us. I think there's a verse in Peter that talks about, let me note it, I'll put it in the notes. There's a verse in Peter that says God gives us his nature. God does not remove the nature we already had. We keep that until the resurrection, when corruptible puts on incorruption. Until then, we have that old carnal nature. That's why Paul would say in Romans 7, but I am yet carnal. I am yet carnal. I'm still carnal. And yet, I know no good thing abides in my flesh. That is in my flesh, he says. He had the Holy Spirit. So God gives us his spirit. So now we have two natures, a Jekyll and Hyde almost. And they fight each other. Galatians 5, verse 16 and 17. I've spoken on that many times. They're constantly warring against each other. The one who wins is the one you feed. The one you, the one you, if you're, fighting the carnal nature and going to God's word and praying and stepping out in faith and not giving in to sin all the time, that other nature of God will grow in you. We must not return to following the old nature like we did before we were baptized. We, have, we shouldn't have desire to sin. We're still tempted to, but we don't want to. Paul said, that which I hate, I still sometimes do. If you still love that, and, and afterwards you feel like, boy, that getting drunk was really great. Or that adultery I just did. Boy, I can't wait to do it with her again. That is not good. <laughs> that, that's following the old nature. And if you keep doing that, you will die. Grace doesn't cover you following the old nature and staying there. No, Romans 8, read it for yourself. Verse 5, 6, and 13. God's Spirit in His favor gives us His mind. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus also. So do the after-baptism sins that we commit, do they cut us off from God? I want to cover a lot of things that sometimes are being preached out there wrongly. Are we no longer children of God each time we sin? 
That's ridiculous. Once I have children, I might even, I might not even want them around anymore. They're still my kids or they may not want me. They're still my kids. The story made very clear in the prodigal son. After the prodigal son did everything debauchery like you couldn't believe. Put slime and mud all over the family name. Father was happy to see him come back and celebrated for this no good so-and-so. No, this son of mine who was dead is alive again. Let's celebrate. I'm going to restore him to sonship, put a ring of authority on his finger. I'm going to put sandals on his feet and the best robe of righteousness over him. Don't think you've lost your sonship or being a daughter of God, no matter how bad your sin was. You repent and you come back to God. There will be celebrations in heaven. If you're hearing otherwise, that's false doctrine. Do we incur God's wrath every time we sin? All over again, no. No, we've been spared from God's wrath by Christ taking our sins. Romans 5 verse 9. He took the wrath for us. Romans 5 verse 9. And 1 Thessalonians 1 verses 9 and 10. Let's put this one up there. You turn to God, cutting the end of verse 9. You turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. You turn to God. You're going to serve the true God now, not idols anymore. So you're, you're not following the old way anymore. You still stumble sometimes, but you're not following it as a way of life. Verse 10, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he's raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. If you're in Christ and you're a new creation, the wrath is gone. Just like your own kids, guys. Come on, men and women out there. Your child's careless, stumbles, bumps their head, maybe breaks an arm. You got to go to the hospital. Sure, you're... I told you to be careful about that, you know, whatever. And, but do you quit loving him? Are you furious at the child? No. You might be a little upset at first. But you bring them and then you give them a hug and say, don't worry about it, son. Don't worry about it, kid. I, we'll take care of this. I, d I did that too. I did that too when I was a child. So anyway... No, your wrath is gone once you're a child of God. How about do you have to face the death penalty after we have God's spirit each and every time you sin? The death penalty, wages of sin is death, right? And you've sinned now. No, you've been saved by God. You have been saved. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9. You have been saved by grace, not of works, okay, by faith. Do you have to face the death penalty? No, it says in uh, uh, Hebrews verses 7 and 27 and Hebrews 9 verse 26 that all of our sins are, are, are taken by Christ who died once, one time, one time for all. There's not a double jeopardy. You've already committed all of that. He's already, because he took the penalties and washed the record away, he sees no bad record. There's no double jeopardy. You can't be tried again. You've given that to Christ who died once for all. All your sins are washed away and continue to be washed as you move forward. That's the text. That's the tense of 1 John 1, 7. Okay? Uh, but if you walk in the light as he is in the light, 1 John 1, 7. If you walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us, ongoing tense. It keeps cleansing us, not cleansed, cleanses us from all sin. This part is not being preached in some churches. When you have really been saved by, and called to salvation, covered by God's favor, now you stumble in sin He's quickly there to go to that spot, that wound in the body, and heal it, cleanse it. 
Is God's favor only for those who always live righteously and don't sin? No. No, there's now no condemnation to those of you who are in Christ. Quit feeling condemned, even when you sin. Because Romans 8, 1, there's now no condemnation, is in the context of Romans 7, where Paul is saying, Oh, wretched man that I am, I still do the things I hate. And therefore, it's no longer me, uh, the new me doing it. No, it, it's that old, that old nature that's dead. It, he says that, Romans 7, it's no longer me. But the context is, hey, I'm talking about a guy, me, who is sinning still sometimes. But who shall deliver me from the body of this death? The end of Romans 7. And then Romans 8 says, I thank God through Jesus Christ. My, I mean, Romans, the end of Romans 7 says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. I, it's almost word for word. I'm just doing it from my head here. Romans 8, verse 1, now there's therefore no condemnation. And John 3, verse 17 and 18 says the same thing, that God so loved the world. In verse 16, you all, know, you all know verse 16, we need to learn verse 17 and 18. Verse 18 says, there's now therefore no condemnation to those who have believed in Christ. No condemnation. Okay, so Romans 8, we read all that. Let's keep reading in Romans 8, verse 3. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement, God's put a righteous requirement on me, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. What happened? Verse 3 says God sent his Son in carnal flesh, sinful flesh, who condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement might be done by him in us, for us. That's the God's perfection message right there. That's God's righteousness imputed, credited right there. Now, so once we receive God's Holy Spirit, now please understand what I've just said here. I want you to all start experiencing the joy of salvation, the joy of God's grace. For goodness sakes, come on. Uh, are we no longer God's children when we sin? No, of course not. That's a stupid question. We remain God's child forever. Um, do we incur God's wrath? No. Do we face the death penalty? No, that's already been faced. It's already been taken care of. Christ died once. He's not going to die over and over and over again for us. It's done. We have to repent of sin each time we sin. Make sure I make a note of that. We have to repent of sin. Make sure you understand that's what I'm teaching. But don't wallow in it. Don't mope in it. Don't remain in that misery. And you read the, the, if you read the Psalm 51 prayer of repentance by David, the first two-thirds of the sermon is, oh, I'm just such a horrible guy. Please forgive me. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Renew the right spirit within me. And all of that. By the last third of, this, of his prayer in Psalm 51, after killing Uriah and adultery with Uriah's wife, he says, now he's feeling, you know, he's feeling that forgiveness. And I want to preach about you and share your salvation with everybody else. It's just wonderful. That's the way we should feel. Now, Romans, I mean, Ephesians 1, what do we get by having God's Holy Spirit? Ephesians 1 says we get the guarantee of salvation. We're guaranteed it. In Ephesians 1, verse 13 and 14, In him you also trust in the gospel of your salvation. That's another definition of gospel. Um, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is or who is the guarantee of our inheritance. The guarantee. It's God in us. The guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. John 5.24 it says here, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has, has everlasting life, shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. This is God's favor. I have passed from death to life. Have you? Do you believe Yeshua? 
Do you believe you have everlasting life? That's what he said. If you believe in him, meaning that you really do, you trust him, you're, you're turning your life over to him, you're really letting him change your life. It's not just a, it's not just a quick verbal thing that, okay, I can get on my life now and do, get back to what I was doing. It's not that kind of believing. But when you believe enough to change you, You have everlasting life. John 3, 36. He who believes in the Son has. John 3, 36. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see death, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now all that's in the present certainty. It's not all, it, it's done. It's already done. It's uh, It's certain. Do you believe the words of Jesus? Do you feel, believe the certainty of your eternal life? Do you know and feel like you're a new creation in, in Christ? Do you believe Jesus? If you don't know all that, maybe you don't understand grace correctly and need to go back and study these and look up the verses I'm, I'm talking about. Uh, you probably need, you're probably works-oriented, probably your own performance-oriented. Instead of trusting and believing in Jesus by faith and accepting that as your covering, accepting him as your life, Tried and tried to get some of you to understand this imputed righteousness and God's perfection and this teaching that God's grace is his favor, his blessing, his joy with you. The new covenant teaches we're, we're a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Paul was able to say, I am confident there awaits me a crown of righteousness, which God will give me and not me only, but all who are awaiting his return. All who are eager to see him come back, Hebrews 9.28, this time without sin for salvation, Hebrews 9.28, Hebrews 9.28. John 10, verses 27 to 29. Here, let's put it up here. Here he says, I will give them eternal life. The ones that he's calling, his sheep will hear my voice. They follow me. I will, I will give them eternal life. They shall never perish and neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. And verse 29 says, and nor will anyone be able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Okay? Once you're a child of God, once you're given that eternal life, God is not going to lose you. He's going to search for you. He may have to put you through trials and troubles and fire and so forth to wake you up. He's not going to lose you. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You've got to tell somebody you believe in Yeshua. You've got to speak it. You've got to confess it. You've got to tell others about it. And believe that he's risen and lives up there in heaven for you. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he who made him, he who, made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Now, God's justice works perfectly with God's grace. God doesn't lose his justice because of all this grace we're talking about. Probably most of us have done some righteous deeds in our life, right? And even those don't count for salvation, though. They really don't. The perfection that God requires is his own. Become you therefore perfect like your Father. Like your Father in heaven is perfect. That's the standard. Sinless perfection. God actually calls Isaiah 64, verse 6 in our Bibles, verse 5 in the complete Jewish Bible. He calls our righteousness filthy rags. The Hebrew there, you know, many ministers don't say what the Hebrew is if they know it. Because it sounds, oh, that's going too far. But these are the words God used to make the visual impact. All the good deeds you're doing, all the righteousness you have. In the complete Jewish Bible, it says all of us are like something or someone unclean. All our righteous deeds, like menstrual rags. I hate to even say it. So even those go... If you have a bucket of your life and in there all your sins and all your righteousness are poured, even your righteous deeds are going to be mixed in with the unrighteous, filthy rags. They just don't measure up. They have to be cleaned out. 
So God poured onto Yeshua, his very own son, every sin ever committed in the world. Remember what uh, John the Baptist said, there goes the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1, 29, of the world, not just those coming to God, but he's opening it up to everybody who will accept it and will make the claim and use that opportunity. But having our sins washed away only applies uh, to those who believe in him, like I said. John 3, 36, we read it earlier. He who believes in the Son has everlasting son, uh, life. But he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life. At some point, they all have that opportunity and have to be able to make that choice. If they don't, the wrath of God abides on him still. But if you do believe, the wrath is gone. You have everlasting life. Now, let's shift gears a little bit. Let's say God's angel comes to you and says, John, or whatever your name is, God has sent me to say that Yeshua, Jesus Christ himself, is going to come and see you tomorrow at 10 o'clock. He has some things to say to you. And then the angel disappears. How will you be feeling about that meeting? I think all of us will feel somewhat apprehensive. And uh, or will we feel condemned? Will we feel confident? If based on our righteous and our zeal, the past six months, we probably aren't feeling so good. But we should, because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Then John 3, 17, God did not send his son to condemn anybody, to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You'd have to go back to that verse. God is not coming to condemn. He who believes in him is not condemned. I do believe in him. So, even though I've been not perfect in my performance, Yeshua's perfect, okay? All our buckets are placed before him, yours in front of your, your, your good deeds, your righteousness, your, all your sins, all your stumbles, everything is in there. Uh, but you've given them to Yeshua. You've transferred, they've been washed out of your bucket. It's an empty bucket at that point. And then Jesus Christ fills your bucket with his righteousness. Now what God sees, what Jesus sees, if he comes to see you the next day, will be a bucket full of his own righteousness. You've, all, you've had your sins paid in full, your, your sins washed away, all by God's favor and grace. And then God says to you who believe in him, you're forgiven. Welcome to the family of God, the house of God. Welcome, dear child of God. We're celebrating you in heaven. I know you've been down a little bit lately, and I just wanted to tell you, we love you. We're waiting for the kingdom to be set up, the, the rule of Christ to be set up here for a thousand years in, on earth. And you will be there because you have God's Holy Spirit guarantees your salvation and the promises made to you. Just wanted you to know that. Keep, keep attached to the vine, keep attached to me and you'll be fine. And we read earlier in Ephesians 1, 13, 14, how the Holy Spirit is the guarantee. Why don't you post it again? Ephesians 1, 13, it's the guarantee of our inheritance. Now here's the part where we fall on our knees when, once he says, welcome to the family of God. He sees, God sees my righteousness. Yeshua is saying to you, my righteousness over you because of his loving kindness, because of his mercy, because of his long, long suffering, his patience and his favor. He loves you. That is God's grace. Here's the part. We fall to our knees, faces on the ground, praising Yeshua, praising God in heaven for the incredible favor, grace, and love. So our life's bucket of sins are now all washed away. And he says, live. Because... All our sins have been taken by Yeshua. He says, because of my son Jesus, live and I will remember your sins no more. Hebrews 10, verse 16 and 17. I will remember your sins no more. Okay, so Yeshua has given you the message. Welcome to the family. I wanted you to know you're still in the family. You've stumbled a few times, you're still in the family. Deeply loved. Highly regarded. Then when God looked at his perfect son's bucket, at this point, all the sins of the world have been put into his bucket. 
God the Father has to say to Yeshua, Son, 2,000 years ago, he said, Son, you've incurred my wrath for all the sin in your bucket of your life. The sins of the world, all of them. Every single person's sins are in your bucket. I'm furious. My justice requires that my wrath be paid out, played out. And the penalty for sin is death. Death by execution. And so, son, you have to die by painful execution because someone has to pay the debt. You told that person that her sins were paid in full. And you paid it. So I have to execute you, son, said 2,000 years ago. Because you see, God is perfectly just. Death for your sins had to be exacted. Paid for in full by Yeshua, the Son of God. So God is perfectly just through Christ's horrible sac sacrifice and suffering for you and me. He's also wonderfully merciful. Looking at your cleaned out life full of the righteousness of Christ, all the debt paid in full, there's no debt needed anymore. I hope you're loving him as never before. So it was that on that dark Passover day, 2,000 years ago on a hill outside Jerusalem, that God's wrath was poured out viciously in the execution of Jesus Christ because of you, because of me, because of the world. But because of that, you and I are no longer condemned. We'll never again be condemned. Romans 8, in context of Paul's sins of Romans 7. In Christ, get this, you'll never again be condemned. John 3.18 says, if you believe in the Son, you are no longer, you're not condemned. While we're still sinners, Christ died for us. And when we see Yeshua in person, one-on-one, -on -one, and he shows you and me the holes in his hands or wrist. They say it was probably right here at the bottom of the hand where they would normally put those nails because a nail right in the palm would rip out. And in Jewish lore and understanding, the hand included the first couple inches of the wrist. That's the hand, most likely, where the holes are in the ankles or feet, uh, the heels. When he shows those to us, we will be like Thomas when he saw the hands and feet and the holes in his side, big gaping hole in his side. You and I will fall down, face on the ground. My Lord, my God. So God's Grace truly is amazing. Romans 5, verse 8 says, While we're still sinners, Christ died for us. Now we're made right. We're justified by his blood. Romans 5, verse 9, We shall be saved from wrath through him. And now we're reconciled. Again, he keeps talking about saved by his life. He, was, he died for our sins. He's raised for our new life. He's raised by living a new life in us. That's why Paul said, I, I'm dying to that I may know you and the power of your resurrection, he says in Philippians 3, verse 9, 9 and 10. He means the power of Christ living in us again. So God's grace is amazing, like the hymn says. Truly amazing. It's my story. I once was blind and now I see... Save the wretch like me. It's your story. Save the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Are you still amazed by his favor, his love for you? Not just pardoning you, but liking you, loving you, blessing you, delighted in you. You've got to know that. Or you'll never move on to part two, the next sermon, living by God's favor. 
We must never lose that first love we had for God. Amazing grace. Even 10,000 years from now, as the song ends, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first began. There can be no boasting in the kingdom of God because it's not going to be your hard work. It's not do the best you can and let God do the difference. You're going to see next time, I'm going to go more depth and running out of time here now, but God starts it. Goodness of God leads you to repentance. Goodness of God forgives you. The goodness of God gives you the power. Goodness of God's going to resurrect you. Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, start to finish, is all his. So please understand, receiving God's grace means receiving God's favor, his joy, his blessings, even as we still stumble. Get that depression, that feeling like such a loser. Loser! We need to feel the victory, the victory we have in him. Let that shine through, that other people are asking you, you have such a peace of mind and a joy, what is it? And you can then do Romans 10, verse 9 and 10, that you confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus is Lord, Lord of your life and saved you. You believe in your heart that he's alive. The tomb was empty. There's so much more coming in part two. Living by God's favor. How Abba was working profoundly with you, probably long before, in some cases, before you were even born. How God was goading us in his love to come to him. How we're supposed to demonstrate God's grace to others as well. If someone's under God's grace and has done horrible things in the past, by all means, talk to that person. Be with the person. Show God's mercy and grace in your heart for people like that. I mean, who were the friends of Yeshua? They were sinners. Zacchaeus, the guy who robbed people of their money as a tax collector, he found great joy. Yeshua called him his friend and all of this. Invited himself to lunch. Some of you won't do that. You don't do it to us who have sinned terribly and been forgiven. It hurts. Show us you're a brother. But we're supposed to demonstrate it, okay? But really, what really happens to all of our sins? Does God really forget our sins? Really? Let's talk about it. How we can really find joy in being a new creation. And how we can see how God really sees us. This is my son. Yeah, this is my daughter, in whom I'm well pleased. Well pleased. That's just another definition of God's grace. Dear God in heaven, our great, awesome creator God, we raise our hands in praise to you. Open the minds of all those, Father, who are your calling, that they will understand more deeply than ever before your profound favor, love for each of us that you're calling and working with and with all the others you're going to be working with as time goes on. Open our hearts to you. Help us claim the victory even when we stumble. Let us get back into the fight and by the power of your Holy Spirit defeat the temptations and the weaknesses and the drives in us that we all still have. We have both natures. Help us listen to your nature. Help us respond to you more. Fill us with your anointing. Pour down the Holy Spirit on those who are listening. And give us your Holy Spirit, your children. Give us more of it. Give us your protection. Give us your word. Give us your mind. We love you so much. Help us love you more. And help us extend this grace to one another. And not be like the elder brother who won't come in and celebrate. That's so bad. We don't want to be like him. We want to be like the father, like you, father, who had a party when his horrible son, who had done horrible things, comes back home. Love you, father. Help us get ready for the next one. Yeshua's mighty name. Thank you so much, Yeshua. My Lord and my God. 
Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.